Well, I'm excited to be back up here this morning, but I'm also excited to see that it's only 9.30, so I've got a lot of time to, to kill up here this morning. I got about four weeks worth of preaching to make up for. That said, I'm, I'm guessing Garen will be uh, changing that clock here before too awful long, so hey man, it is great to, to be back up here this morning. Um, you know, we just finished up a, a series, myself and the other pastors, over the past month, um, reiterating the power of, of God's church, what we're called to do as a church, what it means to be a vital church, what has to be in place. Um, and I, I don't, did these guys not do a phenomenal job over the past few weeks? Can we just give them a hand? I, I don't, they did a great job. Uh, grabbed a hold of the, the vision and, and really did a phenomenal, you know, so here's the thing, and, and it's easy for us sometimes to, we don't know what we've got sometimes, right? Uh, when we have it, we don't know what we've got. And there are churches, many, many churches, thousands of churches that struggle to have one pastor that can preach the word of God with clarity and anointing and conviction. Um, and God has blessed us with four. Is that, I mean, that we're blessed. We're very, very blessed. Um, churches don't keep pastors much uh, anymore for a number of reasons, but um, God has just blessed us with a great leadership in this church. So I just want to personally thank these guys uh, for the work they did behind this pulpit um, over the past few weeks. They, they fed my soul. I'm a little miffed, to be honest with you. Um, uh, Steve got honey buns. Uh, Jeff got Dr. Pepper. Matt and I didn't get squat. So, no, you didn't get nothing. So, I should have brought you something next week. But anyway, I got over it. I don't want Gatorade. I want a honey bun and some Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Diet Dr. Pepper. That's okay. That's okay. But it took some time praying and fasting, but I got over it. Uh, no. I love these guys. Love, I love working with them uh, in the kingdom of God and all and everybody that has a part in, in this church. So if you didn't get a chance to hear those messages over the past four weeks, um, uh, go back there on YouTube. Go back and watch those. But we're going to jump into the message that God has laid on my heart this morning. Um, and uh, I'm convinced um, that this is the word for today. God has just confirmed it uh, time and time again over the last day or two. And uh, the... Uh, the, so many lyrics in the songs and some of the things that Glendella said uh, as she prayed this morning between songs that just reinforce this. So I, I encourage you to lean in this morning, uh, put your hand to your ear and, and really pay attention to what the Spirit would speak um, to you today. I'm going to be talking about uh, being transformed. Um, it's the title of my message. If I was to subtitle it, I'd say uh, transformed a spiritual metamorphosis. What does it mean to be transformed? First of all, what is metamorphosis? You remember what it's, you know, in, I'm surprised that I even remembered that word, but back in, I don't know what grade you guys teach that in, but metamorphosis is, by definition, it's a change of the form or nature of a thing or person into a completely different one. Okay, that's, that's the big thing. Changing from one form into a completely different form, and I like this, is, I, I googled this definition, by natural or supernatural means, being transformed from one thing to another, by supernatural means. So we see that obviously uh, in a caterpillar, right? Metamorphoses into a butterfly. Um, a tadpole metamorphoses. I'm not sure if that's plural, but it, uh, that's probably not right, but you get the point. Uh, you know, a tadpole will change form, complete form into a frog. Um, it, it's been known to, you know, for a, a red and white semi truck to metamorphose into a uh, uh, Optimus Prime, you know. Big, so it's changing from one form into a completely different form. So obviously we're not talking about it from the natural sense this morning. We're talking about it from that supernatural sense, that spiritual transformation, that spiritual metamorphosis that takes place in our lives. It's that which is unholy becoming holy. That which is unrighteous becoming righteous. That which is ungodly becoming godly, right? So we're all born unholy, unrighteous, and ungodly. But we're able to change into that which is holy, righteous, and godly in a, through a supernatural means. Amen. We're going to talk about that this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Let's pray. 
Father, it's a privilege to share your word today. It's a privilege to be called your child. We're thankful for the work that you did at the cross. We're thankful for the work that you're continuing to do in our lives. Lord, we can, we can acknowledge and confess to you today that we're, we're not completely what we need to be. But Lord, we're in the midst of this spiritual metamorphosis and we just pray that you would change us as you see fit. God, that you would show us your way, that you would uh, let us hear your word, uh, that we might be completely uh, obedient to it. Lord, I pray for your anointing today that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would speak your word into the hearts and the lives of people for that is the only thing that can bring change. And I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Anybody who is in Christ, who has confessed him as Lord and Savior, is a new creation. You've been changed from one thing to the other. From that which is sinful to that which is holy in the eyes of God. So Romans chapter 12 verse 1, verses 1 and 2 rather, says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I think we can all agree we want to know what the perfect will of God is, but I think that we can also agree that at times we find it hard to know what the perfect will of God is. And so what the scripture is telling us is the only way we can ever find the perfect will of God is to be transformed, right? Right? So we, we, we see something in this text here that poses somewhat of a problem. So we're supposed to present our bodies, ourselves, to God, a living sacrifice. We are supposed to be holy and acceptable to God. Are we born that way? No, we are born unholy, into sin with a sin nature. We are not acceptable to God because of our sin, yet we're supposed to be. So does that pose a problem? Yes, it poses a problem. So how do I get from unholy to holy, how do I get from being not acceptable in the eyes of God? God loves every person, but we're not acceptable to him because of our sin, right? So how do I become acceptable to God? I have to change. So how do I change myself? I can't. You say, well, that's a problem. I've got to change, but I can't change myself. That poses a problem. That's the good news of the gospel, amen? You can't change yourself, but God can change you. It is a spiritual, supernatural metamorphosis that takes place through the blood of Jesus, and we're going to talk about that transform. So here's the thing. What we also gain from this text is that we will either transform or we will conform, right? Be not conformed to this world. What does that mean, to be like the world? If you conform to something, you are agreeing to follow its rules, to adapt to its structure. I'm conforming. If you, if you have a complete mindset about business, but you are hired into this business who has a completely different mindset about business, you have to be willing to conform to this style of business. Does that make sense? And so we, we will conform to one form of thinking or the other. We will either conform to this world and its uh, worldview, its ungodly, agnostic, atheist worldview, we'll conform to that, or we will transform into the biblical worldview, the worldview of the creator, right? There's no middle of the road, conform or transform. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And right here's where it all begins, right? Our mind in which we think... <clears throat> As our mind transforms, so our whole person transforms. I love what Greg Grishel wrote in, in his book, Winning the War in Your Mind. He said, our lives are always moving in the direction of our, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. So if my strongest thoughts are conformity to the world, I don't want to stand, I just want to blend into the world. I don't want to make waves or I don't want to be thought a freak. So I'm going to conform to the world. That's the thought process of my thoughts. Therefore, that's the way my life is going to go. But if my mind has been renewed, so we need to be transformed by the renewing or the changing or the metamorphosis of seeing of my mind, then I'm fixed now upon that which is the will of God, and that's the direction that my life goes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let me be thankful for that freedom today. Say amen. amen. Thank God for spiritual freedom. Yes. 
And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Everybody say being. 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 And we are transformed through the blood of Jesus. We are now acceptable to God. But transformation is a process, right? Being transformed from what we are to what God wants us to be is a daily process. So he says, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another with unveiled face. So what is, what is that all about, unveiled face? Let me give you just a really very brief explanation of that. So flash backwards here, back to the days of Moses, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai, and he is receiving the law from God, the Ten Commandments and the whole bit. He was literally in the presence of God up on that mountain. Well, when Moses come back down off the mountain to give the, the law and the commandments to everybody else, he literally glowed. I mean, the dude looked radioactive. He was glowing. The people, there was a physical glowing, and, and it freaked the people out. They were like, man, put a towel over your head or something. I mean, they were freaked by this glowing. And so he put a veil on his face when he would speak to the people. What it was was he had the glory of God on him, and the people didn't want to see the glory of God. It freaked them out. So he would take the veil off when he was in the glory of God. He would put the veil on when he was around everybody else. So the Apostle Paul, using that as an example, saying that now through Christ, because Jesus was the fullness of God in person, now we... Without veil, we want to see the glory of God, right? We're not like the people who say, oh, no, I really don't want to see it. It freaks me out. No, we, we through Jesus, want to see and can see the glory of God. We, we long for that. We desire that. And as we see the glory of God through the work of the Spirit, through the Word of God, that, that, that glory begins to transform us, look at here, into the same image. What image is it he's talking about? The image we're looking at, the image we want to behold, the glory of God. We're in one glory now, this human form. And God is changing us into another form, a glorious form that is like him. Hallelujah. From one degree of glory to another. He's taken us from sin nature to divine nature. We'll talk about that a lot probably here today. So daily, we're being transformed. We're in the middle of that metamorphosis. See, the Bible teaches us that we are by nature the children of wrath. Okay? You're born that way. You don't have to teach a kid to throw a fit. The wrath, the rage, it's, it's already in him. You have to teach somebody to steal. That's part of it. That's the sin nature. It's there. By nature, we are the children of wrath. But Peter says we can become a partaker of of the divine nature of God. What is the divine nature? That's the nature of Jesus, the nature of God. That which is good, I can, I'm bad, but I can take on the nature of that which is good through the power of the Holy Spirit, all right? Being changed from one form of glory to the other day by day. Look at your neighbor and say, there's still hope for me. You? Eh. Yeah, there's still hope. So I want to talk about how this transformation takes place because I've already said we can't change ourselves. You can't. Buy all the self-help books you can find. You can't change. Turn over a thousand new leaves. You'll rip the page right out of the, the book. We cannot change ourselves no matter how good intentioned our efforts. Let's talk about how the change takes place. What are the heavy guns in this great work of God? First of all, first and foremost is the obvious it's Jesus' part in our spiritual transformation, the cross. Amen? The greatest work known to mankind was the work that Jesus did at the cross for us. At the cross, Jesus broke the curse of the law and set us free by his grace. It was at the work of the cross and our putting our trust in it where that metamorphosis begins. Amen? It is impossible to change without coming to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross of Calvary. Would anybody amen that this morning? Amen. Impossible to change without the cross. We are, the Bible says, crucified with Christ. We have died with him. The only way to become that new man we were talking about, right? Everyone who is in Christ is a new creature. The only way to become that new man is for the old man to die. Correct? Correct? The only way for the frog, the tadpole to become a frog is to lose his tail, right? Something's got to go. Something's got to change. In order to be the new man, the old man has to die. We are crucified with Christ, and then we are raised again in the newness of life through the power of Jesus' resurrection. Amen? Yes. 
understanding, seeing Christ at the cross and repenting of our sins and accepting that, for folks, it, that's where that metamorphosis begins and we can't change without it. Brings us then to God's part, which obviously all of this is, you know, God's part, but specifically in this point here, God's part in our spiritual transformation is the word. Amen? Jesus provided the cross. God provided the word. This, the word of God, is the one thing that stands between who we are and who we're supposed to be. Amen? I mean, when God looks at you and when God looks at me, he says, okay, I see where you are. Here's where you are. Here's what you're supposed to be. I believe that God, there's, well, we know. I mean, obviously, there's, we're all God's people are supposed to be a certain way. Right? I mean, we're all supposed to have the fruit of the Spirit, and there's certain, but there's, there's individual plans, and here's what I want you to do. And so here's who you are, here's what you're supposed to be, and this is the only thing that stands between us, okay? So the Bible teaches us that the Word of God is like a mirror, okay? When you, and you look, it, it shows you what's wrong with you. So if you were to, for, well, let's look at an example here. If you were to get dressed, let's say you go in your closet, and it's dark, and you're, you're picking out clothes in the dark for how you're going to get dressed. And you end up putting on a purple shirt with orange polka dots and a lime green pair of pants. I mean, you look like the Joker, right? <laughs> you, you would be, but you don't know it, you know, really. You're in the dark. You can't see. You just put on a pair of clothes. Random. Put on a pair of clothes. Well, then when you walk up to the mirror, it shows you what you really look like. I mean, you can say, oh, I'm dressed, I'm, this is good, you, you haven't seen yourself, I've got on a shirt, I've got on pants, I'm dressed, I'm ready to go, this is good enough, but whenever you look in the mirror, you say, that ain't good enough, right, it's, it's wrinkled, you got a big mustard stain on your shirt, and you think, I look like the Joker, this is, I look bad, and it shows you, okay, I need to change and look better than this, and that's exactly the way the Word of God works, we can think to ourselves, oh, I'm good enough, I'm a good person. I do okay. And it's like getting dressed in the dark. We can't see ourselves. Folks, you just, you and I can't see our, our sin very well. I mean, we, we just can't see it. We have a way of, of sweeping it under the rug. The devil comes along and he'll hide our sin from us. So we, we come to the conclusion that we're good enough. But then when we look to the pages of God's word and that mirror shines back into our soul and we begin to see, oh my, I, I don't look as good as I thought I did. There's, there's some changes that need to take place here. You ever been that way? I, it happens to me all the time when I read the Word, which is one reason why people don't read the Word, I think, probably, in, in, in that regard. I'll just, if I don't read it, then I don't see. If I don't look in the mirror, I'm just, I don't worry about what I look like. Well, then you go out uptown looking like the Joker. Everybody else sees it. So we, we say, no, 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 no. I, I want to be right in the sight of God. So I, wanna, so I look at it and say, oh, my goodness, this happens so much. I, I read something and, comes along, you know, maybe about being patient or being tender, you know, brotherly kindness and brotherly love. And, and all of a sudden, like, I'll see myself, I'm like, man, I've become kind of cynical. Or, man, I've, or maybe it talks about humility and think, you know, I've kind of been a little full of myself lately. It's, the, it's a mirror that God has given us that, that helps us in this spiritual transformation process that we're in. We, in order to change, you've got to see what you need to change. Isn't that true? That's what the Word of God was designed to do. Um... Psalm 119, 105 says, your word, this word is, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and it's a light to my path. It is the word that gives me direction to know what decisions, what kind of decisions I should make within my life. In John chapter 17, Jesus says, sanctify them. He's praying, God, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. What does sanctify means to set apart. God is saying, Lord, take my people, set them apart from the world. Make them, don't let them conform to the world, but transform them so that they are set apart. They're a different people. They're a peculiar people. And he's saying here, the only thing that can do that is truth. And the only the source of truth that we have is the Word of God, right? It's so influential in the transforming of our lives. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the Word of God, it's living and active. The King James says it's quick, it's powerful. This Word is alive. It's not just a dead document that's been laying around for thousands of years. It's alive. It can literally speak to me personally every time I read it. Hey, Dennis, this is something, look, look at this stain in your soul. Look, look at this area of compromise. Lord, Dennis, you, boy, you're wrinkled. You need to iron some things out. In your, you need to iron out your priorities, right? You're getting kind of wrinkled here. John 15, Jesus said, you're already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Through my word, we are made clean. Let's 
talk about, so Jesus' part, the cross, God's part, the word, the Holy Spirit obviously plays a part in our spiritual transformation. He's the teacher. John chapter 14, 26, Jesus says this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, King James says the comforter, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So we say, okay, it's the word of God that brings about the change in our life or shows us the change that we need to make anyway. And it's the Holy Spirit that, br- that helps us to understand that word, that teaches us, number one, teaches us what God is saying through his word and then brings it to our remembrance. It's like, it's like sometimes maybe, you know, you get dressed in the, in the morning, you're in front of the mirror, and everything looks good, okay, I, this is pretty good, and then you go outside, you get in the wind, and it blows your hair all over the place, right, and your tie is up around your neck, and static cling, your, your, your pants are coming up halfway up your calf, and, and you don't realize it, and then you walk by like the store window, and it's like you said, oh, well, I look good this morning, and you're fixing your hair, and, you put, and, and that's the way the Holy Spirit works on a day-by-day basis. We look to the word of God, we get saved, he's putting things in order. But as life goes, sometimes we can get out of order. Sometimes we have a bad day and we just don't look much like Jesus, right? Is that an excuse? Is that okay? No, but it happens. So we're going through our day and I'm, I'm in a bad mood, maybe I'm foul, somebody, you know, I'm, whatever the case, and we're just, we're not looking much like Jesus. And, and we come across it and the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance some word. It's like he's flashed a mirror in front of us and he's like, look, look at what has happened since this morning. And you're like, okay, Lord, that, that didn't sound much like you. I'm sorry. For, we begin to get back into line with what God, that's, that's the power of the Holy Spirit that works on a day-by-day basis. <clears throat> God has not left us in this thing to change on our own. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. It's us, it, what it requires, well, let me get ahead of, my, I'll get ahead of myself. The Holy Spirit that teaches us, uh, Philippians says, it is God who works in you both to will and will and to work for his good pleasure. So and again, to find the will of God. What, it, what is it that brings pleasure? Can my life that started out unholy, unrighteous, ungodly, can my sinful life bring good pleasure to God? You bet it can. Not in its current lost condition, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is God who works in you in order to accomplish the will of God in your life. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, we read about the Holy Spirit who moved upon people at times, right? He moved upon David to kill Goliath. He moved upon Samson to kill the Philistines. But now through the New Testament age, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is no longer just upon us. He is in us. Every day, he's driving the ship. So in, and in Galatians 5, th- this work of the Spirit says that the fruit of the Spirit is, by the way, Jeff was preaching. He, he kind of mentioned the fruit of the Spirit all back. I love what he said, we need to be fruity Christians. I love that. I thought, man, the only thing wrong with that statement is that I didn't think of it first. I don't know why, I don't know how I've preached all these years and didn't didn't come to the conclusion that we all are supposed to be called to be fruity. But anyway, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. This This is what the Spirit produces in our life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithness, gentleness, self control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Look here. If we live by the Spirit, let us also, the the ESV says, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Right? The Spirit is what guides us every day and changes us day by day. So we learn to keep step with Him. Right? So that when He steps, I step. When He stops, I stop. And I learn not to... Not to, not to, to work and walk against him. If, if two people are holding hands and one person starts walking this way and one person starts walking that way, that poses a problem. So if you're holding hands, you want to walk in step together in the same direction. And we have to learn, which brings us to our next step in our part, we have to learn to yield to the Holy Spirit that we may walk in step with him. Believe me, there's been many, many and plenty times in my life where the Holy Spirit wanted to go that way and I wanted to go that way. I have played tug of war with the Holy Spirit more times than I can count. But he's stronger than I am. He always wins, right? And all I've accomplished is jerking my shoulder out of place. Literally, just causing myself some undue pain. Whereas if I would just learn to walk in step with the Holy Spirit and let him change me, transform me the way he wants to, I would save myself a lot of, a lot of trial and hassle. So it brings us to our next part. The next point is our part that we play in our spiritual transformation. Now, we know we can't save ourselves. When it comes to our salvation, we play no other part other than to repent of our sins and accept Jesus as our Savior, right? Jesus does the saving. 
So we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about the metamorphosis, the change that takes place, the process on a daily basis. Here's what I am now. I'm saved. I'm saved. That's pretty much all I can say about myself is I'm saved. And here's what God wants me to be. Then I have, there's a part I have to play to get from here to here. What is that? That's simply just to be the yielder, to yield, to, if I'm going to change, I can't do it on my own, but it definitely requires my cooperation. I mean, is that fair? Does that, does that make sense? God is not going to change anybody against their will. He just won't. It's, it requires my cooperation if I'm going to change from one thing to the next and be what God wants me to be. I've got to yield. Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says, Don't you know, or know you not, that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether it's of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We get to choose. We yield to sin. We yield to God. Our, our decision right? So many things, let's, let's be honest with ourselves this morning, so many things, decisions that we make and things that we do and problems we get ourselves into um, were decisions that we made. Not in every situation, I get it, but most, I'm, I'd venture to say probably most, most situations. We have a choice in this thing. We have a choice in the words that come out of our mouth, right? We have a choice, to a certain degree at least, the thoughts that come into our mind. And the more that we yield to the Spirit, the more those thoughts can be controlled. It takes our cooperation. Who we yield ourselves servants to obey, that's whose servants you are, and you will obey them. Second Peter says this, you may become, and I quoted this, let me read it from the scripture now, and the rest of it. You may be, come, okay? You can, not, well, if you're lucky, or no, this is, it's not, forget it, you're too far gone. You may become, partakers of the divine nature to be like Jesus. Here's your sin nature. Here's the nature of Jesus. You can partake of that and you can change. Literally, your nature can change. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires, for this very reason, look here, look here, look here, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And I'm going to talk about this list here in a minute, but make every effort. Does that sound like it may require a little cooperation on my part? Absolutely. Make every effort to supplement, the King James says, to add to your faith virtue. Okay, we have faith. We're saved. That part, God provided the faith for us to get saved, by the way. You can't even come up with your own faith to get saved. So God provided the measure of faith in which now we are saved, and now we make every effort to add to our faith virtue, that which is right, that which is good, to not make, make wrong decisions, to make good decisions, to change the, the speech of our mouth, the conduct of our actions, the nature of our thought. We, we add to our faith virtue, which we can only find out what that is through the word of God. We have to be yielding to, to the word of God. Then we add to our virtue knowledge. You, you know what you know for the most part, Okay, let's say you're saved, you're already saved now. Let's, however many years you've been saved, let's say you've been married 10 years. However much you know about God and the Word of God, you know that much by your choice. Does that make sense? In other words, if you don't know very much about God, that was your choice. Make sense? Because the Word's there, God's there, we, we can know as much as we, we want to, he said, you want to add to your virtue knowledge. Well, that requires our effort. That requires me getting in, studying the word of God, seeking God. However much, however much knowledge we have, we have it by our choice. If you choose to have more knowledge, you can get it. And then goes on to say, add to your knowledge, self-control. What kind of control was it? Self-control in and of itself, by definition, having the word self in it would tell me that means I have to control my, I have to yield. I play a part in my spiritual transformation in that I have to cooperate and learn how to control myself. I get it. We can't, we can't even do that without God's help. But folks, when we get out there, if you got, you got into the world and somebody makes you mad and you just fly off and you just whoop them, you can't say, well, it's God's fault he didn't stop me. Mm -mm. Self-control. We play a part in this spiritual transformation. Uh, to knowledge, self-control. To self-control, steadfastness. 
I mean, I'm gonna, it gets hard at times. Sometimes I think about turning back. Sometimes I get sick of doing what God wants me to do. But, but steadfastness, there has to be something in us that says, no, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep pressing. Steadfastness, we add godliness. Learning more about God will make us more godly, obviously. To godliness, uh, we add brotherly affection. We now suddenly are not just concerned with ourselves, but as we grow in God, we are more concerned about other people. Folks, that has to come by our own will. We have to decide. You, let me put it this way. You have to be nice to other people on purpose. It's not really going to naturally take place and, and doing stuff for other people. I mean, it's something that we have to make the decision. I am going to learn how to put myself aside and meet other people's needs. And to brotherly affection, love. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. But if, for if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these things are at work in us, we are naturally going to transform, grow in our faith with God. Now let's talk about the part that other, be, other believers play in our spiritual transformation. Hey, you got somebody in your life you can look back to and you can see it now. Maybe you didn't see it then, but you can see it now that God has put them in your path. He put them in your path at a strategic time in your life and their input, their testimony, their encouragement, whatever it was, was very influential in you getting saved or you becoming a, a, a stronger Christian. Having faith. I mean, God used somebody to draw you closer to him. Amen. In this process of spiritual metamorphosis is other believers. God will use other believers to bring about this change. Proverbs 27, 17 says that iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. You sharpen a knife, you, if you're going to take iron and make it sharp, you take another piece of iron, which is hard, and you can iron two hard surfaces. It, it sharpens iron. And that's the way God put man sharpens man. See, the man, iron can take another piece of iron and it can take it from, it, 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 first it's dull and it's ineffective, but another piece of iron can make it sharp and effective. We might be dull and ineffective in our walk with God. Maybe, we, maybe sometimes you, you, it's easy to settle into a place of complacency where you just, you're saved and you know that, but that's just kind of as far as it goes. You're just kind of apathetic about things. But, some, but God puts somebody in your life that's on fire for God, right? And through their testimony, through their encouragement, maybe even through their rebuke, God takes you from being a, a dull and ineffective Christian to being a, a sharp and effective Christian, right? As God uses people in this regard. As, as, just as sin and wickedness is contagious, faith and goodness is contagious as well. You spend a lot of time around sinful, wicked people, you're going to go, become sinful and wicked. It's just the way that, it's just the way that it works. We're, we're a product of our surroundings. We are influenced by atmosphere, sin, doubt, wickedness, ungodliness is all very contagious. But man, you spend time around people of faith. You talk about, you spend time around people who are just good people. Don't we just need some more good people in the world? Amen. It's good people. Do, the, do anything for you. Give, you know, give you the shirt off their back as they, as they say. Just, you spend time around people like that. That's, that's the way you're going to become. Iron sharpens iron. We need other believers to become what we need to be in Christ. But see, what the devil does is he wants to come along and cause us to isolate ourselves from other believers, right? We want to stay away from other believers. That's the worst thing you can do. How can, a, how can a knife ever get sharp if there's nothing around to sharpen it? How can we ever reach our full potential in Christ if there's not other people, be it preachers, teachers, worship leaders, or just, you know, your brother and sister in Christ is sitting in the pew next to you. We can never reach our full potential in God and in Christ without fellow believers. I'm, I'm convinced of that according to the word of God. Amen? It's an integral part of our transformation process. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Look here. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul says, Timothy, I have sharpened you, so to speak. I have, God has used me to bring you to the place in your spiritual transformation that you're all right now. Take what I have done to help you and do that to help other people. You be involved in their spiritual transformation and then they will go out and teach others. They will be involved in other people's spiritual transformation. We are so self-absorbed. 
I mean, let's be honest. I, I'm, and I'm, I'm the world's worst. I'm preaching to all of it. But I mean, as Christian people, we are so self-absorbed. It's all about me. Well, I like, I don't like that about that church. I don't like this. And I don't like that. I wish they would do it this way. And we're, everything's about us. So seldom do even God's people stop and say, I wonder what I can do to contribute to somebody else's encouragement today. I wonder, I wonder who around me is really needing just a hug or just a word. And I wonder what I can do to sharpen somebody else. I wonder what I can do. Could God use me to help somebody reach that next place in their metamorphosis? I believe he can. Hey, I'm not the only one. God uses me. I'm, I'm, I'm sharpening every one of us here today. This is my role. This is the part that I play. But I believe that God wants to use every believer to help another believer in their particular process of transformation. Amen? But we got to get over ourselves um, before we're going to be effective in that. Um, and, and I say that there ain't nobody in this room more selfish than me. So I, like I said, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. It's in us. Remember that sin nature we were talking about that all of us have? The sin nature is selfish. It's always get us focused on. So it takes a metamorphosis for me not to think so much about myself and to think about other people because that's what Jesus did, right? Jesus thought more about other people than he did himself. That's the divine nature. Sin nature, selfishness. Divine nature, selflessness. And there's a process, a changing process in, in which we get there through all of, all of these things. Proverbs says, by wise guidance you wage your war and in the abundance of counselors, there is victory. An abundance of counselors, godly counselors, people around us that can speak into our life and encourage us. That's where we find victory. I mean, I could preach a message. I could just go on and on about all these. I've got, I've got to move on here to the next section. Um, but all of these things help to change us because we cannot change ourselves. And so let's, let's flash forward here just a little bit. Um, Jesus, the role he plays at the cross, God, the work he plays in the word, the role that the Holy Spirit plays in being our teacher, the role that we play in just yielding to God and the role that other people play um, in, in being uh, the iron. So what does that end result look like? And what is the butterfly of, of our spiritual walk, right? What are we, what are we aiming for? And, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't think, none of us will be a spiritual butterfly until the day that the heavens part, and Jesus returns, and these, these fleshly bodies fall off. Amen? But as we strive towards that spiritual butterfly, in other, in other words, that completeness of change, what does that transformed Christian look like? What are, we, what are we attaining to here? And let me reiterate here in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Now look at your own life. Compare the, now this is the mirror, Okay? This is the mirror. Don't compare your love to somebody else's. Because you might say, oh, well, I love more than he does, or I'm more patient than she is, so I'm better. No, no, no. Nobody else is a mirror. This is the only mirror. So you have to compare you to this. And so he said, what, is a, what does that transformed Christian look like? It's a person who, through the Spirit, has love. Not just love for people who love them, but love for their enemies. Right? He's like, oh, I thought I had that one. <laughs> right? It's like... Uh, so what does, a real, what does a Christian look like? Love. Oh, okay. Well, I got that. I love people. You have to love your, not just people that you like, but your enemies. Ew. Right? There's a wrinkle. There's a big zit. Right? I look in the mirror and say, well, I, got, I can love my family, but man, that guy that ripped me off or whatever, loving my enemy, whole different ball game. But that's what it looks like. That's what Jesus did. Right? He loved everybody, even his enemies. And so that's what we're attaining to. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So if something, if you look at that, you're looking in the mirror of all of these things and you compare yourself to each one of these. Am I, do I, have, do I really, am I really have peace? Am I kind? Am I good? All of these things. If something is missing, the, um, then, then you have more transforming to do. Right? Doesn't mean you're not saved, necessarily. If you look at that, you say, I, and I would doubt, I would venture to say that no Christian is going to be completely missing any of these things. Right? But I, I think you could probably look at these things and say, well, that's definitely weaker. Right? Maybe, maybe some people just love, they have love oozing out of them. You can punch them in the face and they're still going to love you. People just have that extra gift. I, I'm, I'll just be honest with you, I'm a little short on the patience end of things. Right? So if you look at this mirror and you see, okay, 
that doesn't really look like me. It, it just means that you've got some more changing to do, right? You've got some more transforming to do. The Holy Spirit has still got some work to do. Don't lose heart. Don't assume that because you're not patient right now, you never will be. Because if you yield to the Holy Spirit, you can be, right? John 13, 30, 35 says, by this will all men know that you're my disciples. Here's what the butterfly looks like if you love one another, right? If you love one another, people within this church, without the church, that's how people know it. I love, I love 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul, man, in the whole chapter obviously is awesome. But this is what Paul says. He said, if I, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as that I can remove mountains and I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver up my body to be burned and I don't have love, I gain nothing. What is, what, in other words, what is that transform? Okay, here's what a transformed Christian looks like. Oh, it was somebody that gives a lot of money in the offering plate. They give all that they've got. Nope. Because you can do all, you can literally give every penny you have to the poor and really not be that butterfly, really not look like Christ at all if you don't do, if, if you don't have love at the core of who you are. You speak in tongues, you can have prophecy, all these things, you can do all of these things, but if it's not out of a heart of love, then it's, it's squat, right? Clanging, I don't think Ryan probably didn't leave his drums on. Crash, crash, somebody, I'm talking to you telling you about Jesus, but all you hear is crash, 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 right? Because there's no love coming. No. The child of God, this, this transformed, I'm not, I'm not trying to get to a person who looks more churchy. That's what a lot of people are attaining to, to look more churchy. It's the worst thing we can do. We're, we're striving for a change in which we look more like Jesus in our conduct, in our words, in our thought life. Ephesians says, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling which you have been called in with all humility. Humility, not pride. That's what, it, that's what the butterfly, the spiritual butterfly looks like. When we, we learn to be humble, not prideful. Gentleness, patience. Bearing with one another in love. What does it mean to bear, bear with one another? I mean, sometimes it means you have to put up with people, right? You know, even people hurt you or people annoy you or whatever, but you love people. We learn how to bear... We, we learn how to bear with one another. That's what the child of God does. That's what that end result looks like. Eager to maintain unity. Don't want strife and envy. These people, people in churches that cause rifts and problems and, and factions and all this kind of stuff, that's, that's not what the child of God looks like, right? The true child of God that's, in the, that's really truly in a metamorphosis process is always working towards unity, I'm going to say and I'm going to conduct myself in a way that will bring people together. Not, not that, will, that will divide people. Okay, I'm going to read this and I'm going to, I think I'm going to close. Okay, because I, I got to wrap this up. I haven't preached for four weeks, people. Give me, give me a little slack here. In Philippians chapter 2 says, If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort of love, and there is participation in the Spirit, affection, sympathy, complete my joy, being of the same mind, the mind of Christ, having the same love that Jesus had, full of accord, in one mind, doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, counting others more significant than ourselves, looking past ourselves for the need of others, and so on and so forth. But down to the, I wanted to read that because down to the very part, last part of that is talking about having the same mind that Jesus had, having the form of a servant, right? What is the butterfly? What, is the, what are we changing towards? When we get to a point where we don't want everybody serving us, but we want to do what we can to serve other people, there's been some major changing taking place, amen? What can I do to, to serve you? <clears throat> transformed Christian is, is passionate about the things of God. I got all kinds of other scriptures, but I'm going to forego. I, I probably have said most of these in some form or fashion. So let me, read, let me go down to my very last verse. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. This is the best part of the transformation process. It's the final transformation process. This is when the butterfly gets its fullness of wings. This is when the frog becomes the full frog, right? This is when the semi becomes optimus. This is the end. This is the full transformation. Our citizenship is in heaven. Where we belong, it's not on this earth, it's in heaven. 
And from it, we await a Savior. From heaven, we await Jesus to come back. He promised he would. We believe that he will. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, our earthly body, fleshly body, to be like his glorious body. Hallelujah. By the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This is the greatest transformation. We are in a process of transformation on the inside right now. But one day God will transform us on the outside. This physical body that gets sick and it dies and it has pain, one day will be transformed into a glorious body just like the one Jesus has. That has no pain, no sickness, no death. We can't even imagine that type of, of change. I mean, I can't imagine the caterpillar. The caterpillar just, he has no idea what's in store for him. This old ugly little fuzzy worm, he don't have any idea how beautiful he's going to be. He's crawling around in the mud and on the ground, and that's got to be a horrible life to live. Has no idea that one day he'll have wings and be able to soar above it all. We're, we're just in that caterpillar phase, folks. We're, we're in the, the slime and the muck of life and the sin and the temptation and the, the trials of this world. We don't have any idea of what is in store for us one day when we take on this glorious body. It's worth metamorphosing for. Hallelujah. It's worth enduring the changing process, however grueling at times it can be. Let me tell you something about this whole thing I just got done preaching to you about this morning. It's not, it's not easy, right? When your kids are growing, you go through growing pains. It, it's not easy. It's a growing process. There's growing pains involved. But in the end, it's worth it. All the metamorphosis and the transformation that takes place. Amen. Stand with me to your feet, would you please? And ladies, come to the piano. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Would you bow with me this morning? <clears throat> Father, we thank you this morning for life, for the breath that you have put in our lungs, for creating us, loving us, providing for us every need that we have as part of your creation. Thank you, Lord, for enduring with us, being patient with us through our, through our sins, our failures, our weaknesses. And Lord, we, we all come humbly before you this morning and collectively confess that to you today. Our sin, our weakness, our sin nature, we recognize it. We see it at work. We feel it at work every day in our life. And we don't like it. We want to change. We want to change. We want to be from what we are right now to where you want us to be, Lord, and we know we can't get there by ourselves, But it does require our cooperation to you. And so we want to yield to you this morning. Yield to the work of the Holy Spirit that wants to do a work, not only in this congregation as a whole, but in each and every individual life. Whatever you need to change in me, I'm, I'm asking you to change it. Whatever you're needing to change in every individual, we're asking you to change it. Let us be receptive, cooperative, hungry for your word, forever focused on the cross, hungry for your word, filled with the spirit, in step with the spirit, yielded to you and surrounding ourselves with other people, Lord God, that you can use to help us to change in the way that we need to change. I've delivered your word, this message, as you have seen fit this morning and done my part, Lord, and I believe you to do yours, and I already are, that it's supernaturally, not just by natural words of man, but supernaturally as we all have received these words, that it's by your spirit, you begin to make those changes. Maybe small, maybe big changes, but bring about changes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just yield to the Lord today. Let the Lord speak to you. Go ahead, ladies. Go ahead and sing your songs. I want everybody just right where you're at. Just, just spend some time talking to Jesus here this morning. We do that. Just be honest with him today. You know what changes you need to be made. He knows what changes need to be made. Just come into agreement with God this morning. 
Hallelujah.